Goldman Sachs is niet alleen de machtigste bank van de wereld. Volgens vele analisten is het een staat binnen de staat die door niemand wordt gecontroleerd. Goldman Sachs was direct betrokken bij de financiële ondergang van Griekenland als adviseur van de regering met een eigen agenda on the side. The Greece Golden Deal brought together the falsification of national balance sheets, the activity of the large investment banks to help this process and the EU institutions that approved the process. And this is the nexus of all of these multiple things that together have brought the eurozone into, the, into its current crisis. Vanavond, een onthutsend portret van Goldman Sachs en de vernietiging van Griekenland. Dit is wat u te wachten staat. Inside Goldman, um, certainly when I was there, there was no discussion about whether you're cheating people, because that requires a level of sort of human connection that really doesn't occur day to day in banking. The reason my book is called Money and Power is because first they get the money, then they want the power. It's not so much that Goldman Sachs is ruling the world, but it is like a greater parasite that is threatening to stop the world from rebalancing itself and recovering a sense of democratic control over its future. U kijkt naar tegenlicht. Welkom in uw toekomst. Κύριε Υπουργέ, Υπουργοί, Βουλευτές, Γενική Γραμματής, σας ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Η τιμή είναι πάρα πολύ μεγάλη για ένα όργανο που αγωνίζεται και θα αγωνίζεται πάρα πολύ σκληρά μέσα σε αυτούς τους πολύ δύσκολους καιρούς. Αυτή η εκδήλωση κορυσφαίος θεσμός κάθε χρονιά προσπαθώντας να ξεκινήσουμε με τους καλύτερους ιονούς έχουμε ανάγκη να μας επιβεβαιώσετε και να μας επιβραβεύσετε αυτούς τους αγώνες. Πέρσι από αυτό εδώ το βήμα, σας ευχήθηκα από καρδιά υγεία, ειρήνη και δημιουργία μέσα σε μια κοινωνία πιο ανθρώπινη, πιο αληθινή. Ήταν όμως τελικά η κοινωνία που ζούσαμε ανθρώπινη και αληθινή. Ήταν ένα όμορφο πολιτικό και οικονομικό παραμύθι. Με πονηρό σκόπιμο και υπέρμετρο δανεισμό έβαλαν τη χώρα μας και τους πολίτες της σε μια απίστευτα καλωστημένη παγίδα. Αντί να κυβερνηθεί ο τόπος με όραμα, σοβαρότητα και προοπτική, κυβερνήθηκε επί σειρά ετών με δάνεια, κανοποίηση mm. της εκλογικής κομματικής πελατείας και ευκαιριακής και ροσκοπικής ανευθυνότητας. Αντί να εξοικονομήσουμε τους πολύτιμους και λιγοστούς πόρους αυτού του τόπου, κατασπαταλούσαμε χρόνο και χρήμα. Βιώνουμε πλέον καθημερινά την πρωτοφανή και ουσιαστική εξαθλίαση ενός ολόκληρου έθνους. Greece, when Greece had the drachma, they borrowed lots of money in foreign currencies then. So they borrowed money in yen, in dollars, Swiss francs, trying to basically find um, countries where they could borrow money. And the problem was is that when you borrow in a foreign currency and your exchange rate goes down, the, de the debt goes up. And they had this problem where they were underwater on these um, foreign currency bonds that issued, foreign currency loans. And they didn't really want to, to that to go into their numbers because they were now in, coming in the euro and they had to f stick to the Maastricht Treaty. And they're already, they're already well in excess of the limit. So they were under pressure. The finance ministry was putting them under pressure, the, the, the people in the debt management office. So they were looking around for some ideas and Goldman's kind of bright idea was let's do um, a swap where we change these foreign currency bonds into euros but uh, we do it at a fake exchange rate. And we go into, into a, a different exchange rate to the, to the current one, and that means you shrink these bonds by 2.8 billion euros. Griekenland schakelde de Amerikaanse bank Goldman Sachs in om de afspraken met de Europese Unie na te kunnen komen. Als geen ander kende de bank de financiële technieken om de schuldenlast 2,8 miljard euro lager te laten lijken. 
Daarvan ging vervolgens naar verluid 300 miljoen euro als commissie naar Goldman Sachs. It's a bit like going to a bureau de change and the guy has his sign up with uh, all the numbers like the different currencies and um, and you say so let's say so it's like one dollar per euro and the man says to you, oh, I've got a special rate for you, two um, dollars per euro. Um, and, he said, and you say, well, how come? Because that means I owe you money. And he says, yes, I, you do owe me money. We'll have a special agreement under the table and um, you agree to pay me back. And that's kind of like what Goldman did. So the cross-currency swap was a transaction at this fake exchange rate that shrank Greece's debt by 2.8 billion euros. And then Goldman and Greece agreed to do this special kind of, a different kind of swap to repay the money. And so the two deals came together and Greece then was locked into this transaction with Goldman where it had to repay the 2.8 billion that had disappeared. You can describe it a bit like a subprime mortgage. You, know, you start out, if you remember, you have these people in the United States who didn't have a credit rating, they were poor people, um, they couldn't get loans, uh, they were encouraged to lie or to, to, to make um, false statements on the applications, and they could get these loans. But they couldn't afford to buy these houses, so the banks came up with these special mortgages where they had these very cheap um, introductory rates and then the weight goes up. And it's a bit like what um, this, this Goldman deal with Greece was like. So it's, they had this grace period for a couple of years and Greece didn't have to pay anything. And then suddenly the rate goes up and Greece is then having to pay like 400 million euros a year or 500 million euros a year, a huge amount of money. So that means, and this is what happens in subprime as well, is that you have to go back to the bank and you have to refinance and you have to start to kind of get out of your um, previous um, deal and get into a new one. And what happens is that because you've been accumulating debt repayments, it's all added into the loan. It's what's called, they call it negative amortization. So because Greece wasn't paying the money back in the, in, during its grace period, the missing money would be added to the loan and the loan got bigger and bigger. And um, they were kind of trapped really because you, you've got a very big derivative contract and you, once, you're tr once you're stuck in that contract, to get out of it is very expensive. So even the f a day after um, the, the deal was signed, it would have already cost Greece an extra, I think, 600 million euros to escape, just because of uh, the way Goldman had, had structured this over-the-counter deal. So you're kind of like trapped. All you can do is just renegotiate, and the thing goes up. Greece's problems, critics argue, have only partially to do with speculators, more to do with false economic data, broken tax system, and runaway spending. I'm particularly concerned about the role of U.S. financial institutions, particularly Goldman Sachs, that um, as uh, Greece got on the heroin of borrowed money, uh, Goldman was the crack dealer. Greece wanted to solve a problem. It wanted to be able to move debt off its balance sheet and show that it was less uh, leveraged than, in fact, it was as a country. So guess what? There are people you can turn to for help like that if you want that kind of help. Goldman Sachs is the you know, perfect machine ever created in the history of the world to make money. It uh, has historically been able to get uh, and attract the best and the brightest people there. Interestingly, when Bill Gates was the CEO of Microsoft, uh, he did say at one point that he thought his biggest competitor uh, was not another software company, but was Goldman Sachs because it was a war on talent. And Goldman Sachs had a way of attracting the best and the brightest people to work there. And of course, it's not a secret why. It's because Goldman was able to pay people the most.
more important is this, this culture of communication and sharing information. Uh, most firms where I worked, they're organized around that if you, you know, are aware that your client is involved in doing something, uh, you know, you keep that information to yourself because information is power. Information uh, can result in a fee and that can result in a bigger bonus for you. If you start sharing that information among your colleagues, then your role in bringing in a piece of business or bringing in a fee uh, can get diluted and you won't get as much, quote, credit for it. But at Goldman, they encourage you to share that information. Why? Number one, because that's, you know, keeping your partners informed is is good partnership and good business, but it allows people at the firm to figure out how to make money from your clients in many, many different ways. Goldman Sachs speelde een belangrijke rol in de huizencrisis van 2008. De bank verkocht massaal zelfontworpen producten, waarbij ze hypotheekschulden verpakten in zogeheten CDO's, collateral debt obligations. A CDO is like a package of financial instruments, but if you take finance out of it, it's sort of like if you think of a, of a pie and you think of the crust of the pie and then the top crust also made up of the same kind of dough. And inside the pie, you could have cherries, you could have blueberries, you could have apples, you could have sugar, or you could just have sort of blueberry juice with a few blueberries stuffed in. So if you think of a CDO as a pie, inside there's, there's some elements that have sort of a true nature to them, like real blueberries. But you might only have a few, and everything else is just watered down and juice. Because Goldman is so damn clever, so darn smart, they saw a crisis in the mortgage market coming and made a huge bet against the mortgage market. They, they bet that there would be a crisis. They bet that the mortgage market would collapse. So at the same time that they continued to package up these mortgages and sell them as mortgage-backed securities at 100 cents on the dollar to investors all around the world, Goldman had made this huge proprietary bet using its own money to bet against the mortgage market and what better way to do it than to buy credit default swaps, buy insurance against these mortgage products. Als een van de weinigen die de crisis in de huizenmarkt aanzagen komen, kocht Goldman Sachs op grote schaal verzekeringen op hun eigen CDO's bij verzekeraar AIG. Maar omdat ze wisten dat de kwaliteit van die CDO's hoogst twijfelachtig was, kwam dat in feite neer op het verzekeren van een huis waarvan je zeker weet dat het in brand zal vliegen. What unfortunately happened to AIG is they decided to insure all the risk in the mortgage market. All those mortgage-backed securities they had agreed to insure. And as the value of these securities fell in 2007 and 2008, Goldman demanded more and more collateral from AIG. But as this got out into the market, other firms tried to make these collateral calls on AIG as well, and AIG just sort of ran out of cash. And that's why in September of 2008, they had to be uh, bailed out. And Goldman was the only one who knew that they would benefit from this. They knew John Paulson would benefit, but on Wall Street, they knew they were the only ones that would benefit on it, and it would really, really hurt their competitors, as well as AIG. And that's exactly what happened. So did Goldman cause the crisis? No, but they exacerbated the crisis, and they were the only one to benefit from the crisis. Inside Goldman, um, certainly when I was there, there's no discussion about whether you're cheating people because that requires a level of sort of human connection that really doesn't occur day to day in banking. It, it doesn't. It doesn't even come into play. It's not even part of a conversation. The conversation goes something like, "Hey, there's a bunch of." assets on your books, we need to move them. Okay, well, we're creating the CDO. We can stuff these assets into the CDO. Great, who's going to buy the CDO? Well, I have these 10 customers who are lined up. Great, can we get five more? Great, and it's, it's all about moving whatever it is along the line and making as much money as possible along the line. It's not, well, you know, if we sell part of the CDO to some pension fund in the middle of Europe, they might not understand it, and if it goes bad, they might... That, that conversation never happens. If we sell something to a, a client, a customer, let's just say we've owned it and we sell it to them at 20 cents on the dollar. They buy it at 20 cents. It doesn't mean we think it's a terrific piece of paper, but they think it's worth more than 20 cents. Um, but clearly, we think it's If your employees it's think that it's crap, 
that it's a shitty deal. Do you think that Goldman Sachs ought to be selling that to customers? And when you are on the short side betting against it, I think it's a very clear conflict of interest. I do, I do not necessarily think that's the And case. when you heard that your employees in these emails said, God, what a shitty deal. God, what a piece of crap. When, when you hear your own employees or read about those in the emails, do you feel anything? I, th I think that's very unfortunate to have on email. Are you embarrassed? <laughs> and, and, and very unfortunate. I don't... I don't on again, emails, please, and please don't take that. How about way. feeling that way? I think it's very unfortunate for anyone to have said that in any form. How about to believe that and I think, sell it? I think that's unfortunate as well. No, that's what you should have started with. I, you're correct. It is. I personally think it's insider trading and it's fraud. Um, the investigations that came out of looking into those deals and the timing with which Goldman shorted securities, the specifics of them discussing securities that they knew were bad, possibly that influencing the price of the CDO so they would pretend they were better than they were and that would influence the price of the CDO. All of that, when you start to add it up, is fraudulent. The Department of Justice and the Securities Exchange Commission here have not determined that to be the case. There was a settlement with Goldman regarding that abacus deal, one of their worst performing CDOs, for which Goldman paid $550 million to the SEC and did not say they did anything wrong. The, the part of the settlement was, we say nothing. Unfortunately, it is legal. It was legal. It remains legal. And, it, and it's legal because Goldman and other Wall Street firms have a big hand in writing the securities laws by which they live. Well, while we're sitting here today, Goldman and other Wall Street lobbyists are down in Washington helping to write the new regulations that are required by the Dodd-Frank law that the SEC and the Commodities Future Trading Commission and the Fed and other people are writing the new regulations for. Goldman is sitting there lobbying away and helping them write these regulations. This has been going on for generations. This is nothing new. I mean, Henry Goldman, one of the founding partners of Goldman Sachs, helped create the Federal Reserve System. But unfortunately, we saw the consequences were extraordinary and on a worldwide basis this time. So let's come inside to see. Here's the space that could host the whole company. Here is the heart of the systems. This is our IT room. And this, you can see here, we're also uh, with the contribution of European Union. And uh, we were very proud to be uh, inside the European Union because we were a part of the, of the family. Here it was supposed to be my secretary. There's nobody anymore. We are supporting. The heart of our finances is still operational because the accountant department must be must survive. Yes, it's here. There's two ladies to keep on the taxes. Here we have it was the area manager, the orders department. Now it's just a small warehouse. Here you can see three stores, more than a year closed. Nobody comes to rent, you see. And uh, now we have these signs that said rent or sell. No, they're selling also the property. I have counted in Piraeus 450 shops closed. This happened in October. If I count today, I'm sure it will be over 500, 500 stores. Over 500 stores closed. This shop it's, it was really one of the most competitive shops we have. It's in the center of the city, 18 meters facade and uh, three levels. And uh, it was really, really a very, very profitable store. 
But now we'll have to see what to do. You know, maybe I'm thinking if, if this store cannot do it or cannot find a solution with the suppliers, maybe I should think to make something different. Like? Uh, totally different. Maybe to, we're thinking about some uh, kind of food store or some kind of, um, uh, how can I say, street uh, or catering uh, stores. You know, it's, it's more profitable. Every day turning around the, the, the capital. Of course, with cooperation with uh, some other uh, brand here locally, yeah. more local products. Like, you know, Greece was a poor country, but although with the drachma, it was evolution every year. We have every year something better, going and growing a little bit. Now we have to go from the top to bottom. They told us we are together, one market, uh, but suddenly we're uh, different economies now and not one market. The Germans, I think that for, for the German company especially, we were extremely, extremely good customers, not only in fashion business, but in cars, in uh, technology products. We had uh, several FX losses, and uh, the year 2001, it was three years before the Olympics, we had a fiscal strain ahead of us, and we thought it would be better to absorb and spread out, smoothing out the, the total liabilities of the Greek debt uh, over a longer period. This is not unusual. Many countries, I mean, if you want to have a prudent uh, debt liability management or debt management, then you have to smooth it out. If you are allowed to, to use derivatives, the problem is not the instrument as such. It's how to, uh, you record it in, in, in uh, your accounting books and uh, how you report it. Well, if you ask them at the time, they would simply give you the official story, which is we're minimizing uh, risks and we are managing the portfolio of Greek uh, uh, the, the Greek holdings of foreign currencies, as well as the, the, the Greek state's future income stream. In reality, what you need to do here is to apply the uh, method of a sociologist or an anthropologist. They were, these were uh, people that had worked abroad, outside of Greece, in those investment uh, banks. This is what they knew how to do. This is what they had grown up to do. <laughs> it was what they were educated to do. So um, um, when they came here, they had some bright ideas that they would present to the Minister of Finance saying, uh, well, look, Minister, if we utilize these swaps here, there, and everywhere, then I know that your great problem is how to make the budget look better when you present it in Parliament next month. I can help you do that. The Minister usually didn't, wouldn't understand precisely what was going on because those were very complex instruments that these golden boys and girls had trained to understand and to utilize in a way that maximized their monopoly of, of power through ensuring that others wouldn't understand what was in them. And, and, and the ministers were very easy to convince simply because the argument seemed quite uh, powerful. The argument was you are reducing your risk. Secondly, Eurostat doesn't mind because it's legal. Thirdly, everybody else is doing it. It would take a very superior intellect on the part of the minister or somebody with an extremely strong ethical objection to what was going on, combined with knowledge, to say, no, I'm not doing it. What Goldman was doing was making a loan to Greece. Goldman didn't want to make the loan, so it hedged itself. So it went out and on the other side and it bought a CDS, credit default swap, to hedge Greece. So then it charged the money um, to Greece to basically, uh, so it, Greece had to pay to protect Goldman from its own default. And that was charged to Greece. And then there was all this interest rate and currency hedging. That was also charged to Greece too. And then there were these bets that um, Greece was making. And if they went wrong, Greece had to sort of pay Goldman um, the mark-to-market change of those. So all of those things together 
it, it's very hard to say how much Goldman actually made, and they and they're not they probably don't want to tell us either. With the, the benefit of hindsight, they will say that uh, you don't do swaps for such long periods because you uh, have uh, you put a lot of risks in your book. But back in 2001, this looked very uh, a good way to uh, help Greece to absorb certain problems they had accumulated over the past. At the time the swaps were done, they beautified, in a way, the fiscal picture of Greece, but they're not the real cause for the problem we're facing now. The issue, the problem with the swaps of uh, the the much publicized swap of Goldman Sachs, etc., was a five billion euro issue. The problem of Greece is that we have debt of 360 billion and a GDP of about 200, 210. So it's not the five billion that actually is the straw that breaks the camel's back. It's that, uh, that's just, that's why it's important to put it into perspective. Otherwise, people think that the, the beginning and the end of the problem is the swaps, which is far from it. We're talking about a relatively, a relatively small amount, uh, which in the greater scheme of things is not significant. What is significant, as far as I'm concerned, is th the way that uh, these transactions tell a story about the ethos of that period, not just in Greece, but throughout. Uh, what um, upsets me more than anything is that, as far as uh, the European Union is concerned, Eurostat, this is a perfectly legal transaction, a transaction that was going on throughout Europe, and that it was not frowned upon. So um, you can't even point a finger and say that what was going on uh, violated the rules of the European Union. Eurostat was, was asked to approve deals like this. We're talking about the statistical agency set up in, in, with a budget, um, directed by the Commission to, to um, to operate, to, to check the statistics of all the EU countries and also to implement accounting rules for the national governments. And it drew up this thing called ESA 95, which was its rule book. And I had a copy, it's a big book. And they should have had a better understanding of these transactions. And maybe they should have had advisors who, who understood about derivatives, but there were these loopholes. And I, on what I imagine happened was that there were lobbyists from the governments who went to the Commission or went to Eurostat and said, um, will you just write this here in the, in the rule book? We, we need to do a deal, so will you write it in there? And you can see it in the ESA 95, you see it's in different kind of font. They, they change things and they put these loopholes in there. But the point is, and this is very important, is that the single currency was supposed to give people confidence that um, a large range of countries with very different histories could converge, um, have the same standards of, gov of fiscal governance. And that was a lie. And unfortunately, Eurostat was used, uh, and maybe Eurostat was naive, but Eurostat was used to enable this to be a, to be a false promise, which is now, I think, has resulted in a lot of damage and there's a, a lot of investors who, who aren't going to come back um, to the Eurozone for a long time because the trust has gone. So that, I think, is the, that is the damage that's been done by deals like this. But you don't have to understand, there's a long history of Goldman Sachs, ex-partners uh, and ex-employees working in politics, uh, working in government, working in charitable organizations, working in educational organizations. Goldman Sachs uh, ex-partners were all over the U.S. government uh, and to the point where Goldman was referred to as Government Sachs. 
Now, in Europe, that same thing has been unfolding over years. Currently, the head of the ECB, Mario Draghi, was an advisor on the international side of Goldman Sachs. Mario Monti came from Goldman Sachs, who's a sort of technocratic, bureaucratic, whatever you want to call it, uh, leader now in Italy, having taken over from, from Silvio Berlusconi. So you have all of these people in place in very powerful positions. I mean, I think you have to understand that why does this happen? It happens in part because Goldman Sachs is, as we've talked about before, is able to attract the best and the brightest people. The other thing that happens at Goldman Sachs is you sort of have a half-life of time that you are allowed to be in the spotlight at Goldman Sachs, that you are allowed to be at the top of the firm as a partner. Uh, you know, usually have eight to ten years where you can, you know, be at the top, be running that firm, where you're making millions and millions and millions of dollars a year. But then, to their credit, Goldman Sachs says, okay, your time here is up. We have to make room for the next generation, the next group of young, aggressive, ambitious Goldman Sachs partners who want to run this firm, and it's time for you to leave. And, you know, as the reason my book is called Money and Power is because first they get the money, then they want the power because of the relationship with Goldman, the relationship with the ECB, the relationship between Goldman back to the U.S. and the Federal Reserve. You have this whole circle of people that can continue to avoid analyzing what the real problems were and how the risk of the banking system itself was what is hurting Europe and how these kinds of trades are really much more dangerous and, and should be looked into and should be um, shown to be the culprits behind a lot of the European crisis. And yet you have the people in command that can contain that story um, and spin a story that's completely wrong and be in a position to then suck out austerity measures from the population who's being hurt because these banks are liable, their local banks are liable to banks like, like Goldman and, and large international banks because of bad deals they've been involved with. Well, there's a very, a very good allegory. It's not that it's ruling the world, but it is like a, a giant squid which is sitting on the face of the, of the, of the world uh, and sucking it out dry, and the world cannot move without it. Uh, so it, 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 I like this allegory. Um, it's not so much that Goldman Sachs is ruling the world, but it is like a greater parasite that is threatening to stop the world from rebalancing itself and recovering a sense of democratic control over its future. Το, τα ασφαλιστικά ταμεία έχουν πέσει, δεν έχουν χάσει κάθε ρευστότητα. Που με αυτά τα εναλλασσόμαστε κάθε μήνα. Το θέμα είναι το ότι εμεί δεν πληρωνόμαστε από αυτά. Όταν έχει το ασθενή εδώ, δηλαδή με τη συνταγή, μα πληρώνει τη συμμετοχή του ένα 25%. Το υπόλοιπο το περιμένουμε από τα ταμεία. Τα ταμεία έχουν γύρω στου 6 με 7 μήνε να μα πληρώσουν. Οπότε καταλαβαίνετε ότι αυτό δηλαδή δεν, δεν μπορεί άλλο πλέον να, να πιστωνόμαστε εμεί. Μόνο και πρέπει να μου το σημειώσετε αυτά. Ότι ξέρω ότι γενικά οι φαρμακευτικέ εταιρείε, ειδικά αυτέ που προμηθεύανε το, τα νοσοκομεία, δηλα, που είχαν μεγάλα ποσά, α πούμε, του δώσανε ελληνικά ομόλογα. Που φυσικά αυτά τα ομόλογα, άμα τα άσπαγε αυτή την περίοδο, ήταν. ούτε τα μισά λεφτά δεν έπαιρνε. Δηλαδή, ε, τη στιγμή που εγώ θα παραγγείλω το φάρμακο, θέλουν τα λεφτά μετρητή. Δηλαδή, πρέπει εγώ στην τράπεζα να πάω, να τα καταθέσω σε ένα λογαριασμό και μετά να μου το στείλουν. Αυτό φυσικά προποθέτει και ότι θα έχουμε τα λεφτά. Δηλαδή, να σου πω συγκεκριμένα, δηλαδή, μια, μια κυρία τώρα τα Χριστούγεννα που ήρθε με καρκίνο του Πάγκρεα, όχι αυτή ο άντρα τέλο πάντων, ήθελε ένα φάρμακο από τη Ρος, Το οποίο έκανε 1700 ευρώ. Θεωρητικά, σύμφωνα με ένα καινούριο νόμο, αυτά τα φάρμακα πρέπει να τα έχουν τα νοσοκομεία. Και να τα παίρνει ο στενή από εκεί με νοσοκομιακή τιμή, δηλαδή πιο φθηνά. Αλλά επειδή τα νοσοκομεία δεν δίνουν μετρητή, ειδικά στη Ρώση, στην εταιρεία που είναι από τι μεγαλύτερε και εγώ που έχει τα περισσότερα φάρμακα, ε, είναι αναγκασμένοι οι ασθενεί να ψάχνουν να βρουν φαρμακείο, ποιο φαρμακείο έχει ρευστό να αγοράσει το φάρμακο για να του το δώσει. Οπότε έρχεται σε μένα, εγώ παίρνω τη Ρώση τηλέφωνο την εταιρεία και <coughs> τέλο πάντων λέω το πρόβλημα. Χρειάζομαι μια συνταγή, με δει το έχω το νοσοκομείο, χρειάζομαι το φάρμακο αυτό συγκεκριμένο. Και μου λέει η κυρία, θέλω τα λεφτά, αυτή η υπάλληλο, θέλω τα λεφτά στην τράπεζα να μου τα βάλετε και εγώ θα σα στείλω σε μια μέρα. Το λέω στην κυρία. 
Η κυρία φυσικά δεν έχει 1.700 ευρώ που να τα βρει για να πάει, να, να πάρει το φάρμακο. Και άρχισε και με πίεζε με τη λογική του ότι θα πεθάνει ο άντρα μου. Σα παρακαλώ, βοηθήστε με. Τα βγάλει αυτά τα, τα Χριστούγεννα, βγάλει την Πρωτοχρονιά. Ε, οπότε σε φέρνει σε μια θέση ότι είσαι αναγκασμένο να πα στην τράπεζα να βγάλει από την τσέπη σου λεφτά πλέον, να πληρώσει το φάρμακο για να σου το φέρει. Δηλαδή εκεί είχα τη μία μπροστά μου την κυρία να κλαίει και την άλλη υπάλληλο, φυσικά υπάλληλο δεν φταίει αυτή τη εταιρεία, θα μου λέει, ξέρω εγώ, τα λεφτά. But American banks are doing, particularly the, the derivatives, the large banks, the Goldman, JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, City Bank, is they're trying to get involved in derivatives transactions, in, in default transactions with respect to certain European countries, so that they basically are receiving money or premiums on these default transactions to ensure against the possibility of, of a default. So, so in that respect, they're basically making money between now and if a European country defaults. Um, ultimately, they know that at some point, or they believe that at some point, there will be enough of a bailout of European countries that they can turn around and, and make money because they don't believe, having just seen what the U.S. did in, in the U.S., which is they, it bailed out and provided a lot of cheap funding to its banking system, they absolutely believe that same thing will happen in Europe. It's a question of timing. So they go short first. They provide insurance for other people who are ex or other companies or other banks that are exposed to Europe, so they make money on that as well. And then at the end, they can, they can basically buy back their shorts and, and make money. We opened the first open polyclinic uh, 20 years before in the center of Athens, and it was for the foreign people, for refugees. Now, because of Christ, we find the increased number of Greek people coming for medicines, for uh, medical help. <laughs> These medicines came from the citizens, from schools, all uh, different organizations, because we asked, we, uh, from our side, we asked for the medicines, but we have not uh, proper um, stock for this. Lipon, this is, here we have uh, boxes with uh, medicines 2012. 2012. That, it expires in 2012? Uh, no, 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 no. Oh. Yes, it will be expired for 2012, and this is 2013. Before it was a kitchen, uh, here is the volunteers that are fixing the food that is all came today. And before it was kitchen, the, here we have uh, uh, vaccines, if you want to see. Um, Insulins and vaccines here. The, the medicine that needs uh, fresher. <laughs> Λοιπόν, κοίταξε να δει. Από τη στιγμή που δεν έχει πρόβλημα που κάνουμε καρδιογράφημα, είναι καλό. Ότι θηροειδή τώρα δίδαμε, είναι καλό. Γι' αυτό εγώ πιστεύω ότι αυτέ τα χικαρδίε είναι λόγω άγχο και λόγω στρε που περνά. Και εντάξει, είναι η κατάσταση τώρα ειδική στην Ελλάδα και καταλαβαίνω. Οργανικά από εμά σου λέω είσαι καλά. Δεν ασχολούμαστε με τίποτα τώρα γιατί δεν έχει να ασχοληθούμε. Είναι άνεργος ο άντρας μου εδώ και ένα χρόνο. Ασφάλεια δεν έχουμε. Ερχόμαστε εδώ πέρα στους γιατρούς και για φάρμακα. Εδώ πέρα τελείωσε η Ελλάδα. Ό,τι και να κάνουνε δεν γυρίζει πίσω. Τέλος. Έχει πεθάνει. Είναι πεθαμένη. Και μαζί με αυτήν πεθαίνουμε και εμείς. Οι πιο μεγάλοι δεν θα παθούν τίποτα. Εμείς θα τα πάθουμε όλα. Δεν έχουμε εισόδημα. Ζούμε με τα μακαρόνια, με τα ρύζια, με τα γάλατα. Με τώρα τα Χριστούγεννα μας δώσανε από ένα κοτόπουλο. Δεν ζούμε. Δεν ζούμε. Τώρα με βλέπεις με φως. Όταν θα έρθεις, παράδειγμα, μετά από κάνα μήνα δύο, θα με δεις χωρίς φως. Και χωρίς νερό. Θα με δεις ακόμα χειρότερα. Αν δεν βρει μια δουλειά. Πώς. Για πες μου. 
όταν δεν έχεις χρήμα, τι, τι θα γίνει δηλαδή. Τα λεφτά μας σήμερα είναι 3 ευρώ. Τι θα κάνω με 3 ευρώ. Πες μου, τι θα κάνω με 3 ευρώ. Το 2000 είχα ανοίξει ένα μαγαζί. Να προσπαθήσω να κάνω κάτι καλύτερο για μένα. Το 2002 δεν πήγαμε καλά. Και μου ρίξανε ένα πρόστιμο γύρω στα 11.500 ευρώ. Τα οποία, όπως είπαμε και πριν, δεν ελέξανε. Γι' αυτό φτάσαμε και στη φυλακή τώρα. Και πήγα στην εισαγγελέα για αυτά που σου είπα εδώ και της εξήγησα την κατάσταση και ξέρεις τι μου είπε. Ότι εσείς καταντήσατε την Ελλάδα έτσι, από τα 25 χιλιάρικα. Για μας τα ρίξαν, σε εμάς, επάνω. Όχι ότι οι αλήτες αυτοί τα τρώνε και ο καθένας από αυτούς έχει 500 σπίτια. Αυτή έτσι γύρισε και είπε, αντί να υποστηρίζει τον κόσμο που πεινάει. Και, και είναι νορμάλ οι οικογένειες, έτσι, είναι από χρέη. Ούτε ναρκωμανίδες είναι, ούτε οι παιδιά σε ιδρύματα έχουν αφήσει και θέλουν να την βγάλουν λούφα, ούτε τίποτα. Έχουμε οικογένεια με παιδιά και προσπαθούμε. Και δεν μας δίνουν τίποτα, δεν μας λένε τίποτα να μας βοηθήσουν, παρά να μας βρίζουν κιόλα. Γιατί είναι αλήτες οι άνθρωποι, θέλουν να καλάζουν και αυτό για να πας εκεί πέρα να τους καθαρίσεις όλους. People in Greece think that there may need to be some kind of Tunisian-style revolution or something where the political order is changed. Because at the moment you've had for the last 20 or 30 years, you've had two different political parties that just basically buy votes by giving people jobs or, um, or spending money. And that's one of the reasons the debt has just kept on going up. I mean, and that's why the EU has a task force in Athens. I mean, they're there, they're trying to fix it. Um, because they want to get the money back. I think they, they, they probably should default. I think the, 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 the big problem is, is, is can they, do they have to leave the euro? If they could stay within the euro and default, that might be the most honest thing for them to do. That they, they, they would be terrified of leaving the euro, and if they left the euro, they'd, they'd become like, um, I don't know, Lebanon or something. It would be a, it would be a disaster for them. The problem is, is, if they defaulted, that would mean the European Central Bank would take a hit. And at the moment, no one is in Europe is prepared to let that happen to the European Central Bank. It would be another bailout, in a sense. So I think that's, it's politically very, diff, very tough, very tough. So at the moment, that's why the debate is about persuading the private lenders to take a loss. But that's restricting the, the debate to them and keeping the ECB and the IMF out of it. If, if they lost money, then that means the, the wealthy countries have to put money, they'd have to inject money back into the ECB or the IMF to make up the difference. That's another bailout. Politically toxic. I just think the situation gets worse. If you don't, for example, if, 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 a, if a human body has cancer and you don't get rid of it, it will spread and it will grow and it will kill them. Um, and it doesn't help to say, well, you know, if they eat better or if they jog in the morning, whatever, if the cancer's there, it's there, and you have to find it and you have to get rid of it. And what's happening in Europe is there, there still exist, and in the U.S., massive amounts of trades that are underwater and going wrong every day. Sockgen, which is one of the largest banks in France, is trying to sell a almost yeah an 800 billion euro portfolio of of U.S. related 2007 minted mortgage securities. This is like years after the mortgage crisis supposedly started and ended. So there is still a lot of toxic mess within the walls of these banks because of that. They are losing money because they thought they were going to make money on these trades, which they haven't. They haven't therefore used money they could have used for local growth. Therefore, nations aren't doing as well. Therefore, all of Europe isn't doing as well. And this keeps perpetuating because nobody has said, wait, stop, let us see what's really going on here. And until that happens, it continues to get worse.
banking sector has to change. It got too big. It, um, it became addicted to constructing deals that weren't um, valuable, weren't socially useful. It, uh, it, it, it paid bonuses to people on the basis of just generating this endless flow of these deals, building up balance sheets, building up huge trading positions. And uh, every few years, you know, you have a problem with one of these banks. They, they need to shrink and <clears throat> they need to be controlled. Uh, uh, to me, you have to create the right incentives, you know, uh, on Wall Street for people to behave the right way. You can't rely on people to do the right thing, uh, unfortunately. So you have to create the right incentives for people to do. You have to make it in their interest to want to do the right things. When Wall Street was a series of private partnerships, and every partner had his or her own capital in the business and were liable up to their entire net worth if something went wrong, then you had a system where people were doing the right thing because it was in their interest to do the right thing. But by the mid-1980s, most firms were public, and that changed the dynamic on Wall Street completely because you had a, a bonus culture substituted for the partnership culture, and people were given huge incentives to take risks with other people's money to get a bonus. You know, why not swing for the fence? Why not sell as many mortgage-backed securities as you possibly can, you know, even though you have no idea what's in them or the kind of nuclear bombs that you're setting off all over the place? Because your bonus was determined based on selling those mortgage-backed securities, not on wondering whether or not they came back to bite you. I am encouraged with things like the Volcker rule, for example, in America. Because that, the Volcker rule, can you the Vol the Volcker rule stops banks making bets, basically. Mm -hmm. And that takes one of the most toxic things out of the system, which is where you have a bank that has, um, takes deposit money, it's backed by government, it's backed by a central bank. It's, it's got a socially valuable role because it lends to companies, lends to people. Yeah, we, we need a bank. And then attached to this bank is a casino, is this thing where people bet. Now, if you... One, maybe the simplest thing to do is just to cut off the casino, but maybe the next best thing is to say no one could do any betting in the casino, or at least the bankers can't do any betting, which is what the Volcker rule does. It makes it much harder for banks like Goldman to, to take on those kind of deals like the Greek deal. But it does once again show that the incentive system on Wall Street drives people's behavior, and nobody has touched that incentive system. It's the same incentive system it, now as it was before this crisis. And until I've said to Lloyd Blankfein, Lloyd, you need to be a leader now. You need to change the incentive system on Wall Street. You need to show the rest of Wall Street, who is out of capacity to do it themselves, and of course the government doesn't even understand it well enough to do it, and it can't be imposed upon them from the government. You have to make it in the interest of your employees to behave in the right way. You can do that, Lloyd. I have laid out ways for him to do that, but basically everybody ignores what I've said and nothing has changed. What did he answer? That's an interesting idea, Bill, but uh, you know, uh, thank you for suggesting it. And that was the last I ever heard from him. Yeah. And nothing has changed. Goldman Sachs wilde alleen telefonisch reageren en hechtte eraan om de volgende verklaring voor te lezen. I want to be very clear about this. The swaps we executed for the Greek government in 2001 were not designed to help Greece join the Euro. The suggestion that they were is simply not true. The truth is that Greece was already part of the Eurozone when it entered into the swaps. Greece actually executed the swap transactions to reduce its debt to GDP ratio because all member states were required by the Maastricht Treaty to show an improvement in their public finances. The swaps were one of several techniques that many European governments used to meet the terms of the treaty. And the swaps we executed for Greece were done in accordance with Eurostat rules.